My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask you for pardon of my sins and grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my God and Angel, intercede for me. Today, in the middle of Holy Week, we live what is called Spy Wednesday. That's the traditional name for today because it considers the day when Judas went to the high priest to betray our Lord. So we're in Holy Week and yet isn't it striking how Holy Week also points us to the possibility of a complete lack of holiness, the deviousness of the high priests, the treachery of Judas, the cowardice of the apostles and our cowardice too because we know Jesus that we wouldn't have done any better than the apostles. We're no braver. So in many ways, there are tragic elements in this week. But also, those same tragic elements point to a greater glorious reality. The reality of our freedom. God wants us free. Lord God, you want us to be free because you want our love. And this is the risk of freedom that you have taken, Lord God. How important this risk is in parenting, in the church in all sorts of ways, in our own lives, to take the risk of freedom. Not to mollycoddle, not to overprotect or straitjacket, even with the best will in the world. St. Josemir would talk about how his parents gave him a lot of freedom. They were very wise. They kept him short on money, so he had to keep in touch with them. But they left him very free. And in today's Gospel, we see Jesus' careful preparations for the Passover. Lord Jesus, how much you love us. You had everything prepared, the preparations of love, with the eyes of love and the details of love. You tell the disciples to go to such and such a person in the city and you tell them what to say. You explain to them that he'll show you a room and you must prepare the Passover meal there, you tell them. But of course, even then there was freedom. They might have chosen not to go. They might have got distracted and gone to the pub instead. Jesus, you always respect our freedom. You take the risk of freedom. You leave space for human agency and human initiative. And those two disciples would have also prepared things in their own way, with their own touches. I really love those words of St. Paul to the Ephesians, in which he says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Thank you, Jesus. This is so beautiful. You've got it all prepared. The whole script. But we have to follow it freely. And we see how a great actor adds his or her own flourishes to the script. Their own unique touches. The fact that you have to follow a script doesn't mean that there's no freedom. Not at all. Great actors do a lot with a script. They really make it their own. God, you've prepared it all for us. Those good works you want us to walk in. But we can choose to follow your way or not. And with our own unique personality. We can use that personality to go to heaven. Or to be damned. Those very gifts that you give us. Can be for our making. Or our undoing. How tragic Judas was. One of the twelve. He heard and followed Christ's call. Jesus he saw your eyes of love resting on him. Those eyes calling him to something more and greater. His heart was stirred within him. He responded to your call with enthusiasm. He was called to be a leader of the church. He could have been a great saint even after his betrayal of you, Jesus. He would have lived those joyful days in Galilee when the disciples said to our Lord, Everyone is searching for you. He would have been loved by Our Lady, by you, Blessed Mother. He helped to distribute the bread in the multiplication of loaves. He would have gone with the other disciples to Martha's house and she would have fussed around him for love of you, Jesus, treating him as one of her own. And yes, he would have shared the hardship of Christ's life, happily at first, the long journeys, walking through rain, the cold, the blazing sun beating down on them, the lack of rest and me time. And maybe at first, He welcomed this. It was enough to be with Jesus. And clearly, he had some talents. 
he'd been entrusted with the common fund. It's surprising that it was him and not Matthew, the tax collector, who had been chosen for this task. Jesus would have had good reasons for this. He certainly had a head for numbers when Mary of Bethany lavishly anointed our Lord's feet with expensive ointment. Judas quickly worked out that that ointment was worth 300 denarii. In other words, a worker's salary for 300 days of work. He knew his ointments and he had an eye for everyday realities. And also, he had personality. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind. So when Mary did that, he spoke out in complaints, meanly, greedily, but he spoke out. He had strength of character to speak out. And yet maybe the hardship of the road the lack of privacy, not having anywhere to lay his head, like you, Jesus, the constant demands of the crowds, began to get to him. And having control of the common purse, he began to use it. When they got to a village, maybe Judas would sneak off to buy himself a treat. He began to resent Christ's poverty and found subtle and secret ways to get round it. At first, little by little, But also little by little, the coins coming into the fund began to shine more brightly before his eyes. He started to see them more than Jesus. After a while it became notorious. The Apostle John had noticed it, and no doubt some of the other Apostles. Jesus, why didn't you stop him? Why didn't you send him away, or at least take the common fund from him? Why doesn't Christ stop more quickly sin or abuses in the church? It's a mystery but it's linked to freedom. Eventually his greed grew so great, those snowdrops, falling one by one, had turned into a rolling snowball, and finally into a sweeping avalanche. And that greed swept him away. He went to the high priests and asked, What will you give me if I hand him over to you? They gave him thirty silver pieces. How his eyes would have shone on seeing them. Wow, luxury is short. When Jesus was done away with, he could retire on that or set up a business and become wildly rich. Here, Jesus, you teach us the importance of poverty, living within our means, living simple lives, not being attached to wealth. Because if wealth begins to control us, it will destroy us and we'll only truly find freedom if we are free from wealth. And Jesus, you tried to warn him. You dropped hints at the Last Supper, where Judas was present and even ate the Eucharist, perhaps the most sacrilegious reception of communion ever in history. He was among the first twelve ever to receive, and yet the most sacrilegious. Jesus, why don't you stop sacrilegious communions? You know, Lord, you know best. Why doesn't the priest? Because maybe we can't without betraying confidences, or things we know but can't say or even act upon. Jesus, you then become more explicit. You're trying to warn him. You announced your betrayal at his hands. When evening came, Jesus was at table with the twelve disciples. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you solemnly, one of you is about to betray me. They were greatly distressed and started asking him in turn, Not I, Lord, surely. He answered, Someone who has dipped his hand into the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man is going to his fate, as the Scriptures say he will. But alas for that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Better for that man if he had never been born. You're trying to warn him, Jesus. You're trying to show him that you know what he's about. And Judas gives that horrendously false answer. Not I, Rabbi, surely. And Jesus, you said to him, they are your own words. In other words, you condemn yourself by those words. You then sent him out. What you're going to do, do quickly. Even then, not all the apostles realised, perhaps only John and Peter, John who asked about it, and Jesus gave him the sign, dipping the morsel and handing it to Judas. And John might just have had time to whisper to Peter. Even in the garden, Lord, you gave him a chance to repent. Friend, on what errand have you come? You called him friend, and he could still have been your friend had he stopped then. That kiss, like a wound on your cheek. Here, Jesus, you teach us the lesson of little things. Little betrayals become big ones, but little acts of fidelity lead to great sanctity. In pauca fidelis, because you have been faithful in little things, that's like the formula of canonization. You tell those servants, because you have been faithful in little things, enter into the joy of your master. Enter 
into heaven. There's a story told of one of the great moments of a passion play in Oberammergau when the actor playing Judas was really laying on thick having betrayed our Lord he was expressing his despair I'm ruined, I'm ruined, I've ruined everything there's nothing I can do and then there was a dramatic silence to add to the effect but then suddenly a child's voice was heard clearly speaking to his or her mother but mummy why doesn't he go to Our Lady? That's surely what Peter would have done after his denial. And that's what saved him. With Mary, there's always a way back to Christ. And even after great sin, the possibility of great sanctity. I give you thanks, my God, for the good resolutions, affections and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you for help to put them into effect. My Mother Immaculate, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me.